There can be no equity and justice in Nigeria without a new constitution, says Senator Jonah Jang. And Nigeria's older generation cannot solve the problems they caused. So what do we need? These and more on Plus Politics. And I am Mary Ann O'Connor. A combination of pressure groups in the South and Middle Belt recently gave the federal government a 90-day ultimatum to review the constitution of the country. The reason being, the 1999 constitution is lopsided and the military government cannot draw up a constitution to serve democratic rule. Well, joining us to have this conversation about our constitution, uh, our former speaker, Cross River State House of Assembly, John Gall Lebo, and of course, Professor of Law at the River State University of Science and Technology, Professor Richard Wokocha. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to start with you, Prof, because you are a professor of law. Now, Nigeria seems to be running uh, two different kinds of systems of government as one. And just as I started in my opening, there are several calls for um, a review of our systems of government and also a review of the constitution. But why, do we even, why did we even at any point decide that we were going to run a unitary and a federal system of government together in the first instance? Who came up with this idea? I think... Um it wasn't a deliberate decision. Uh, we began the country as a federal state uh, with three regions that were fairly autonomous and capable of carrying on uh, their activities as entities within the federation uh, or within the Republic of Nigeria. Uh, the military came in and brought in uh, that hybrid situation. Uh, they have a, a unitary command uh, which they had to deploy in the political administration of the country. And somehow, after the military left the scene, we've been unable uh, to reconstruct our politics and reconstruct our constitution uh, to give us back what is ours, which is the, region, the uh, Republican scenario, which should go with a federal constitution, which we have. So we intended to have a federal constitution, but we have left in the 1979 and 99 constitution provisions which are clearly unitary, uh, which is responsible for what you are observing now as a, what looks like a deliberate decision to run uh, a hybrid or a combined, a combined constitution, uh, constitutional order of unitary and federal system. It wasn't deliberate. Uh, we just failed to remove what the unitary military government infused into the constitution when they came in. And now, talking about the military you know, writing a constitution for us. Former um, Plateau State Governor, um, Governor Lalong, called that same constitution, that's the 1999 constitution, a military constitution. He called it a lopsided constitution. And he said that um, we need to revisit the idea of jettisoning that constitution in its totality. Do you agree with him? Uh, definitely. Um, as I said, there are things left in the Constitution that we are carried over from the military uh, mentality and military sense of administration, which need to be removed. Now, the military left the scene 22 years ago. For me, it's not about the military. Why have we failed as a civilian people and as a civilian government? Why have we failed to make the necessary amendments that will enable the state to be a federal state? Yes, the military was there, but that was 22 years ago. So we must take responsibility for our failure to do what is needful. We focus on things that are not important, and we leave the critical things that should enable us to function very well as a nation. Let me go to you, um, um, former Speaker, House of Assembly, uh, Cross River State, Mr. John Gall Labour. Let's talk about the legislature's role in all of this. At the point where we decided in 1999 that we were going to become a democratic system of government, of course, uh, we knew that we were going to have lower and upper houses. Why was this not a, a consideration, and not just a consideration, but 
an action taken to make sure that the constitution that we're going to be running a democratic system on fits, you know, the system of government that we're running it alongside. Okay, I think I think that um, the first thing you need to bear in mind is that, like Prof said, the unitary system of government that we have favors um, the structure that is that is suited to the national assembly structure. Mm -hmm. Now, the national assembly, the two uh, two houses in the national assembly, the Senate and the House of Reps, are beneficiaries of the unitary constitution in the sense that the devolution of power facilitated all the important legislative items as exclusive to the federal government and this is exclusive preserve of uh, the National Assembly, either the Senate or the House of Reps. Mm -hmm. The second order schedule of the Constitution, which provides for uh, the concurrent list, is also automatically also belong to the National Assembly. So my answer is that how do you expect somebody who is the beneficiary of the system to change it? Your first roadblock into amending any constitution or trying to bring the constitution into its original nature is the National Assembly. They will never alter that provision that because the constitution, the way it is, was designed in such a way that the unitary system of government favors a strong National Assembly and the state. I was speaking of the House of Assembly. We were virtually on sabbatical. <laughs> There's nothing to talk about in the House of Assembly of the state. Everything, including resources, all control of that is, is with the federal government, including now, waterway is with the federal government. Hmm. You know, so that is the, that, that's the main issue. I I'd like to push you further on this. You have already mentioned the fact that if you are a beneficiary of something, you obviously don't want to change it because you know what you're enjoying from it. But then you were an insider before now. You were sitting in your state assembly. Um, were there conversations around that also? Because you, it's easier when you're no longer playing the game to say, well, uh, we didn't do anything because we were benefiting from it. Were there conversations? I've heard many people, um, politicians, raise the issue of constitutions being changed. We've had lawyers speak about it. But as legislators, were, were, was there a concerted effort in any way pushing for a constitutional review of sorts or an amendment that uh, would block all or plug all the loopholes that our 1999 constitution has? Yes. Um, first of all, there has been several attempts to amend the constitution. The two most important attempts were made in 2005, being the, um, the, the, the uh, uh, a, a, a constitution review uh, committee put on by President Obama and Joe. That constitutional review meeting brought in memoranda from across all the states and ethnic groups in Nigeria. And if you read that report, I still have that report, it is very detailed about what we need to do to bring the constitution to become a federal constitution. That document was never implemented. When President Jonathan came into office in 2014, he put up, also put up something like a constituent assembly with over 146 recommendations. How to carry out a surgical operation in the 1999 constitution and bring it to become a federal constitution. It was also not implemented. However, as speaker, we pushed for amendment. I was chairman of speaker's forum in terms of constitutional amendment. I was chairman of the speaker's forum in terms of constitutional amendment. I presided over the 36 other states, and we considered about 13 or 14 items for constitutional amendment. We were just very fair, um, uh, not too young to run, local government autonomy, all of those issues. Those issues, are not at the at the next center of the complaint. The next center of the control, complaint in the constitution is the concentration of power in the hands of the federal government, the control of resources in the hands of the federal government, a unitary police system that only the inspector general of police can take care of. But if, if this was, this because what you're saying now is playing to what I asked, if you're saying that the nerve center of the push is the fact that power needed to be taken from the executive into states. States should have been the ones carrying this matter on their head for, uh, in a manner of speaking, right? Let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me let me just put it this way. The process of amending the constitution as administrated in section eight of the constitution, you know, terminates also with the National Assembly and terminates with the president. Now, what as a lawyer, they call it exercise infutility. Why will you go into a venture? We had about one, uh, 40, uh, 46 provisions in that constitution. And then we did about 23 amendments. The president signed only four. I refused to sign the other one. National Assembly threw some of them out. And the president signed only four amendments. Now, 
what do you think you would do? Remember, like Professor Mokota said, the whole idea, this 1999 constitution is a fraud because it's a coup against the Nigerian people. Now, once they put up that structure of the unity system of government, we are done for unless we get it in this constitution. Every attempt to take back that constitution by way of amendment will be blocked by the executive. The president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria will not sign any provision that will take any control of resources. Interesting. Anything that says give, give, give uh, uh, Niger Delta State 20 or 30 percent of the resources, they will block it. Now, finally, how do you even talk about a national assembly that does not represent, it, is not, it, uh, it doesn't have equal representation across the whole state? Kanu State has the highest number of na national assembly members. Kanu State alone has more national assembly members than Akwaibo, Cross River Delta, and Rivers put together, House of Rest members. So, at the end of the day, that school uh, favors a particular section of the country and favors the federal government. Anybody who becomes a national assembly member is more comfortable we, uh, with the country. We will go into the politics of it, but let me go back to Professor Wakocha. Uh, in 2015, vice presidential candidate for the People's Democratic Party and former Anambra State Governor, uh, Mr. Peter Obi, said that um, what Nigeria needs um, to change is the constitution. And he also said that the constitution not alone can be change, but we need to change the structure in which the country is being run. Um, he also said that we don't necessarily need to change presidents for things to change in this country. He said that if we still have the same constitution and we bring, for example, um, Joe Biden to be president of Nigeria, we're still going to face the same problems that we're facing uh, or that we faced in 1999. So if we were to go about changing the constitution today, Professor, where do we start? Because you, we've had stuff about the National Assembly playing a role, Mr. President. Now, before we get ready for 2023, can this message that um, can this message be rolled out again? Will we be able to have a president who is thinking in that direction, not just for himself, but people-oriented programs like changing the constitution? Look at what we're dealing with. Yesterday, we talked about the restructuring of the country, and my guests also harped on the fact that there cannot be a restructuring if you do not change the constitution. Is there any form of constitutional change or review in sight? Do we see that happening anytime soon, or are we going to keep going through the motions until somebody or an angel comes to save us? Well, um... As they say, you don't win. The, you don't change a winning team. But let's start with the issue of uh, an angel. I have also repeatedly told my students in the class that even if you bring Jesus Christ to run the Nigerian state, he will fail for the first time in his long life, unless it starts by changing the minds of the Nigerian politicians, and perhaps touching up a little the minds of the Nigerian citizens themselves to make them a little more active. We cannot change the structure of governance. We cannot change the way things are in the country unless you change the constitution. And if you ask, as you have asked, what do we need to change? I tell you, you can change to start with two things. Ensure fiscal federalism by changing the control of resources in the country. That enables every unit of the country to be productive and to be able to take control of the incidents of their life. This is not new. This we did in the First Republic. So it shouldn't be rocket science for us because it's something that has been done before in this country. If you do that, you put both responsibility and resources in the hands of those who are directly sitting over those things that need to be done. And what makes the difference between a true federation, as we like to call it in Nigeria, and um, a banana republic like we presently run more or less, is fiscal federalism. So if you leave everything in the hands of federal government, leave control of all resources in the hands of federal government, and you expect things to somehow be different, it won't work. I said at the beginning that a winning team does not need to be changed. As uh, Mr. Speaker said, presently, the situation favors the central government. So they won't see the need to change it. It is the responsibility of citizens to pay the price of liberty and democracy, which is vigilance by making sure that they produce sufficient argument and sufficient heat to cause 
those who are comfortable with the situation to rethink the situation. If you leave it to them, they will go to sleep. They are comfortable. If you take home cool 32 million or more in a year as a senator, why should you complain? Hmm. If you take home the sums that they take away from the House of Reps, why should you complain? You are comfortable. So we have to cause change to happen. Change cannot come from the beneficiaries of the change. On that, I agree completely with uh, Mr. Speaker, who spoke uh, uh, just uh, before now. I, I agree mean, completely with him. We need to create change. The citizens need to drive the change. And those who feel the, the impact, the states, and they have the capacity to do so. They preside over the units of the country, the six units of the country. They have capacity, if they desire, to cause the change that needs to happen. And the center will respond. Never mind that Kano has a large number of uh, representatives. When what you are arguing favors Kano state itself, then the representatives of Kano will buy into the argument and they will support it. Hmm. So we need to work along that line, along the line of uh, the bridge between states, uh, uh, legislative representatives' uh, competence, which is the one uh, Mr. Speaker talked about earlier. We need to work along citizens' lines, uh, networks, and create sufficient need for change. You saw it recently with the answer situation. Mm. If it was possible with that, why can't it be possible with other things? Interestingly, so let we me, need to drive the change. Let me push you uh, uh, again on the NBA because um, I, I noticed that in Nigeria, we do not necessarily have a lobby system. Um, but in the US, you, you see where um, associations, groups, NGOs, uh, companies um, sponsor um, or get the um, services of lobbies to push certain narratives or bills um, to on the floor and then um, hopefully those things become you know law um, what is the nba doing in this issue i mean i have quotes from different sans i'm gonna go get to them but can the nba as a block across the 36 states of the federation not push for this constitutional amendment uh, and maybe in some way, I don't know if the lobbying system works in Nigeria, get certain representatives who may also be lawyers to buy into this narrative. The NBA occupies um, a very unique position and I think it has capacity to do a lot more than it's doing at the present. Um, let me not say the NBA is comfortable with the way things are, but I think one can say that they don't appear to be sufficiently conscious of, uh, of uh, what needs to be done. Uh, there's been interventions from the NBA, but we've seemed to have had our little problems here and there. I was chairman of uh, the Omog branch of uh, NBA uh, until uh, 2019, or yeah, about June 2019. Uh, I am not satisfied that we have pushed sufficiently. Yes, we are a professional organization, uh, or a professional association, but it's a unique association that has capacity and capability to reach the state better than almost any other professional organization. The attorney generals are members, and even by engaging the attorney generals who can drive sufficient consciousness and through the attorney generals reach the structure of government, which is the state uh, government or the federal government. Mm -hmm. But the NBA at the moment, I must say for me, is not doing enough to drive this change. Yes, they have unique opportunities and they can do better than they are doing, but we are presently not doing so. Back to you, uh, Mr. John Golabo. Um, let's talk about security votes, which people have over and over again, um, you know, complained about, especially because governors take billions at the end of the day um, in the guise of um, these security votes. And they're not accounted for. These votes are not necessarily something that has to do with the democratic system. This is something that was co-opted from a military era. How come it's still being allowed to go on several years down the line? And everybody keeps saying, oh, it's a military thing, but we're still allowing it to run in a democracy. And those monies have never, ever been spoken of. Well, I, I think that, um, like uh, Prof said, you need to... We need to go maybe beyond the constitution to be able to find diagnosis for some of our problems. And the fact remains that you can't be looking at um, uh, the constitution as 
a single magical document that can solve a problem. Security vote is not in itself um, bad. I've been, I've been number three man, I've been speaker. I've, I even acted as governor for a, a short period of time. And I know that one of the things that you need in a case of an emergency, you need to be able to deal with certain situations. It's always been there, but not as alarming as it is now. Now, the problem now with security votes is that as long as you have a law called the Revenue Mobilization and Security Commission in place, you can't solve the issue of security votes because it is at that point that the security vote is calculated, is arranged, is articulated, and apportioned to the various states. You can't account for it. But, what, it is but, not but, part but of the why project. is what, yeah? So this is this is, this is the question is. everybody keeps asking. Why is that? Is there that secrecy on the number? We. The government gives account of everything else but the security votes. And there is also a tendency of a lot of corruption happening in the guise of security votes. Nobody's saying that it's not okay to vote some monies to um, fight insecurity, but why is there some... It's shrouded in so much mystery. And that's the question everybody's asking. Why? Well, it's, 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 not, it's not the fact that it is shrouded in mystery that the issue. The, 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 the main problem is the utilization of the fund itself. Okay? Because um, I, I have been in a situation where I had, we had about um, 11 communities overtaken by flood in Cross River State. And there was a need for them to come to the House of Assembly to seek for funding for the state's emergency management to intervene. Now, all of that period became very difficult, and the government decided to intervene the security vote. Later on, when the project process was done, it said, yes, we spend this from the security vote. So when you have a governor that accounts for it, the security vote is actually important. Now, let me give you another instance. When we had the COVID-19 breakout, there was a need, no state, including the federal government, contemplated COVID-19 in its project, but there was a need to be able to, uh, to spend in emergency before you go to budget provision. That was provided for. But now, with the corruption in Nigeria, Security vote is no longer sustainable. It's an, it's, a, it's an instrument of fraud. It's a channel for fraud. Now, the danger, even with what I've seen as speaker, is that you don't know how much it is. You don't know the limit and the end of it. And so it has to be something that has to come to a national conversation. And it needs to be dealt with first from the national level. The president has security vote. Why do you think that the president has so much um, uh, protocol around him? The governor also has a lot of securities around him and protocol. He spends from the security booth. And a lot of people who see the governor as a, a mini jitter, a messiah who should be a political philanthropist, come to the governor because of the security booth. Most of the people who aspire to run for public office today, they will tell you they are human rights activists. When they get into office, it is because of the benefit of the security booth that sit out there. Now, it is such that because you can't account for it, it's not budgeted for, nobody knows about it. If you're, you're running a mini government within the government when you have security votes, it's an issue that has to be dealt with. Like I told you. Well, uh, I want to thank you, gentlemen. Unfortunately, that's the most we can take. Okay. Um, well, Professor. It hasn't, hasn't been as bad as that prior to okay. um, the enactment of the revenue mobilization law. All right. Well, thank you very much. Professor Richard Wokocha is a law professor at the River State University of Science and Technology. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, John Gall Labour is a former speaker of the Cross River State House of Assembly. Thank you, gentlemen. We have to wrap things up here. Thank you. Well, we'll take a short break. And when we come back, the PDP chieftain Ojong Ogbo says... Let the present generation of Nigerians take over control of the country in 2023 so that the country can be fixed and secured for the future generations. Is that really what we need? We'll be right back after the break.